Book 9. While Aeneas was admiring his shield, Juno sent Iris down from heaven to bold Turnus, who was sitting in the sacred grove of his sire Pelumnus, and Thaumas's daughter with pale rose lips. Turnus, what no god dared promise you, time in its turning has brought unasked. Aeneas has left his town and his fleet to visit Evander's Palantine realm. Not only that, he has gone deep into Etruria to recruit the country folk, all the way to Lydian Cortona. What are you waiting for? Now is the hour to call for your chariot. Quit stalling and take your, their camp by surprise. Iris spoke, rose into the air on wings, and in her wake left a huge ark beneath the clouds. Turnus knew it was the goddess, and spreading both his upturned palms to the stars, implored, Iris, skies of glory, which god sent you to me down along the clouds? What is this sudden brightness in the air? The mists have parted, and I see the stars that roam the sky's field. Whoever you are that calls me to arms, I follow the omen. And with these words he went to the river, scooped up water, and prayed to the gods over and over, burdening heaven's air with his vows. And now the whole army was advancing over the open plain, rich in horses, rich in embroidered robes and gold. Messapus rode point, Tyrus's sons brought up the rear, and Turnus rode in the company's middle. Like the Ganges River rising high in silence, fed by its seven solemn streams, or the Nile sinking into its channel after it has flooded all the bottom land with its rich water. The Teucrians saw a sudden cloud of dust gathering on the plain and darkness rising. Caicus shouted from the foremost rampart, Something big is rolling this way, black as night, every man to arms, and on the walls, the enemy is here. And with a roar, every last Teucrian came inside the gates and took his position on the wall, just as Aeneas had ordered when he left. If anything should happen before the return of their general, the Trojans were not to take the field, but only hold the fort, protected by the walls and mound. Even if shame and anger prompted them to retaliate, they were under orders to bar the gates and await the enemy in the towers. Turnus was now flying ahead of his lagging column, twenty picked horsemen riding with him, and arrived at the city unexpectedly. He was mounted on a white-flecked Thracian stallion, and his golden helmet was plumed in crimson. Which of you men will be first with me to attack the enemy? Watch this. As he spoke, he rifled a javelin into the wind to start the battle, and towering on horseback, scoured the plain. His company cheered the throw, and followed after him with bone-chilling screams. They were amazed that the Teucrians still lay up in camp. Unwilling to join battle on a far field, Turnus rode wildly back and forth and around the walls, searching for a way in, but there was none to be found. A wolf lies in wait by a crowded sheep pen, growling through midnight wind and rain, huddled beneath their mothers. The lambs keep bleeding, and the wolf rages and snaps at the prey it cannot reach. Tormented by long hunger, its jaws thirsting for blood. So, too, the Rutulian, as he scanned the walls, his iron bones burning with grief and rage. How can he get in? By what strategy can he flush the Trojans out onto the plain? The fleet lay close to one side of the camp, hemmed in by mounds and the running river. Turnus attacked it, calling to his men to bring fire. He wrapped one huge hand around a blazing pine, and his whooping comrades, inspired by his sheer presence, stripped the campfires and armed themselves with smoking torches. The lurid glare spread toward the ships, and the god Vulcan lifted the swirling ashes to the sky. What god, O muses, turned these flames away from the Trojans? Who drove this conflagration from their ships? Tell the old tale as it has ever been told. Long ago, when Aeneas was building his fleet on Phrygian Ida, preparing to sail the seas, the Berecynthian mother of gods herself interceded with Jupiter. My son, now lord of Olympus, grant the prayer of your own dear mother. Once I had a grove, beloved through the centuries, a pine forest on the mountain's crest, a sacred wood, dim with dark fir and black trunks of maple. I gave it all gladly to the Trojan hero when he needed ships, but now I am anxious. Relieve my fear, let a mother's prayer prevail. Battered and blasted, let these ships not fail. Let their birth in our hills win them this grace. 
and in reply her son, who spins the stars. Mother, where are you summoning fate? What do you want for these ships of yours? Should keels crafted by mortal hands have immortal rights? Should Aeneas pass through perils unimperiled? What god has such power? No, but one day, their duty discharged as they lie moored in the Ausonian harbor, all the ships that have escaped the deep and brought the Dardanian captain to the fields of Laurentum, I shall transmute, tearing away their mortal forms and bidding them be goddesses of the great sea, like the Nereid Doto, or Galatia, breast shearing the brine. Jupiter spoke, and ratifying his oath, by the black swirling waters of his Stygian brother, he nodded assent, and with his nod made Olympus tremble. And so the fates parsed out their time, and on the promised day Turnus's outrage signaled the mother to repel the fire from her sacred ships. First, an eerie flash of light blinded the eye, and then, coming out of the east, an immense cloud circled by Ida's mystic dancers rushed across the sky, and the voice that fell from the ocean of air sent shock waves through the ranks of Trojans and Rutulians alike. Do not trouble Teucrians to take up arms in defense of my ships. Turnus will sooner burn up the sea than scorch my sacred pines. Go free now, goddesses of the deep. The mother commands it. The ships at once ripped their cables free of the banks, and dipping their beaks dove like dolphins into the depths, and then each, a great wonder, rose as a mermaid and swam in the waves. Awe oh, shriveled the Rutulian souls. Even Messapus panicked, and his horses shied wide-eyed with fear. The river itself fell silent as Father Tiber stepped back from the sea. But Turnus did not lose his nerve. He responded by seizing this chance to steal his men's spirits. It is the Trojans these portents are meant for. Jupiter himself has taken away their usual crutch. They're as good as dead, even without Rutulian sword and fire. With no escape by sea, no hope of flight, they have lost half the world. And we hold the other half, the land, with so many thousands of Italy's people taking up arms. The oracles these Phrygians boast of don't scare me one bit. Venus and fate were paid in full when the Trojans first touched the fields of Ausonia, and I have my own fate to cut the heart out of a race guilty of stealing my bride. It is not only the sons of Atreus who feel that pain, not only Mycenae that gets to go to war. Oh, but Troy has already suffered enough. One offense would have been enough, if only they didn't deeply despise every woman on earth. These are men who put their hope in half-built walls, puny ramparts, that merely delay their death. Didn't they see Troy's walls, built by Neptune, go down in flames? But which of you, my chosen troops, is ready to chop down this fence with me and terrorize their camp? I don't need arms made to order by Vulcan, or a thousand ships to face the Trojans. They can have all the Etruscan allies they want, and they don't have to fear stealth by night, or theft of their palladium, and we won't skulk in the hollow belly of a wooden horse. No, I mean to ring their walls with fire and broad daylight, and I will make sure they know they are not dealing now with the youth of Greece, whom Hector held off for ten long years. The better part of this day is done, men. Use what's left for some well-earned rest, and rest assured, we are preparing for war. Messapus was in charge of blockading the gates. He posted sentries along a ring of watchfires encircling the walls. Fourteen Rutulians captained these stations, and each was attended by a hundred men, purple-crested, gleaming in gold. They trotted to their posts, and when not on guard, lay in the grass, draining bronze bowls of wine. The fires shone bright, and the sentries spent the sleepless night in games. The Trojans looked down on this from the wall. Although they held the high fortified ground, they were anxious, restless, testing the gates, building gangways out to the towers, hauling up weapons. In command here were Menestheus and the intense Serestus. Aeneas had put them in charge of the troops and the state as well, should adversity knock. The entire army camped out along the wall, sharing duties, peril, and the watch by night. Stationed at one of the gates was Nisus, fierce in his bronze. His father was Hyrtacus, and the huntress Ida had sent him to be Aeneas's companion, quick as lightning with a javelin or bow. Next to him was Euryalus. No one more beautiful followed Aeneas or wore Trojan armor. Still a boy, his face showed the first hint of a beard, 
One love united them. Side by side they would charge into battle, and now they were on watch together at the gate. Nisus was speaking. Do the gods put this fire in our hearts, Euryalus, or do our passions become our gods? I've been eager to do battle or to do some great thing. My mind just won't rest. You see how the Rutulians are getting careless? Just a few fires winking, the troops flat on their backs, drunk and half asleep, dead quiet for miles. This is what I'm thinking. Everyone, the elders and the people, is demanding that scouts be sent to summon Aeneas and brief him. Well, if they promise what I want for you, the glory will do for me. I think I can find beneath that mound a path that leads to the walls of Palentium. And Euryalus, struck by a great love of praise, said to his ardent friend, Are you refusing to let me join you in this supreme adventure, Nisus? Am I supposed to send you out alone into danger like this? My father, Opheltes, the old warrior, didn't raise me that way during all our struggles with the Greeks, all the terror at Troy, nor have I been that way with you, following great Aeneas to his utmost destiny. For, for you, one who scorns the light, who believes that honor which you too strive for, is bought cheaply with life. And Nisus, I have no doubts about you, nor should I. No, and I pray that Jupiter, or whichever god might look on this with favor, will bring me back to you in triumph. But if, as does happen in business like this, some god or just bad luck takes me down, I want you to survive me. Someone your age is worthier of life, and I'll need someone to commit me to the earth after my corpse is dragged out of battle, or perhaps ransomed. Or, if circumstance prohibits the usual rites, to perform them in my honor by an empty tomb. And I would not want to be the cause of grief for your mother, who alone, of many mothers, followed her boy and left Acestes' haven. But Euryalus said, Stop offering excuses. I'm not going to change my mind. Let's get going. With that, he roused the guards and for the next watch. They took their positions and Euryalus went with Nisus to find the prince Ascanius. All creatures throughout the land were asleep, their cares forgotten. Not so the Teucrian captains. They were deep in council, debating what to do and whom to send to bring word to Aeneas. They were standing in the middle of the camp, leaning on their long spears, shields shouldered. Nisus and Euryalus burst in on them, begging to be heard on urgent business. It was Aeolus who came forward and welcomed the nervous pair. He asked Nisus to speak, and the son of Hyrtacus began. Please listen to us with open minds, men of Aeneas, and don't judge what we have to say by our age. The Rutulians have succumbed to sleep and wine. We see a place to ambush them in the fork by the gate nearest the sea. The fires have gone out there, and black smoke rises to the sky. If you let us take this chance, you will soon see us here again with spoils from a great slaughter. Then we can follow the path to Palentium and to Aeneas. On our hunting trips down those dark valleys, we have sighted the city's walls, and we know the whole river. Then Aletes, the grave old counselor, said, Gods of the fathers of our fathers and of Troy, you do not intend, after all, to blot out our race, not if you have brought us youths with such spirit and steady hearts. Saying this, he held them both by their shoulders and clasped their hands. Tears flowed down his cheeks as he said, What rewards can match such glorious deeds? The gods will give you the most precious rewards, the gods and your own good character. The rest Aeneas will bestow upon you, as will young Ascanius, forever mindful of service so great. And taking up his words, No, I will go further, Ascanius said. My sole safety lies in my father's return, and so, Nisus, by the great gods of the house of Troy, by the Lar of Asaracus, and by the inner sanctum of Hori Vesta, I implore you both, and place in your hands my hope and my fortune. Call my father back into our sight. Our gloom will be gone at his return. As for gifts, I will give you a pair of silver goblets, richly embossed, that my father got at the sack of Arispa, two matching tripods, two great bars of gold, and an ancient bowl that he received from Sidonian Dido. And if it is our lot to take Italy and divide the spoils of war, you have seen the horse that Turnus rides, and his armor all gold. That horse, that shield, and those crimson plumes I hereby set aside as your reward, Nisus. And besides this, my father will give you twelve chosen matrons, beautiful all, and men too, captives of war, each with his armor. And on top of this, whatever land King Latinus holds, 
and you, Euryalus, revered in your youth, which is close to my own, I welcome you with all my heart, with open arms, as my friend and companion in every deed. No glory will be mine that is not yours. In war and peace, in word and in action, my greatest trust will be placed in you. And Euryalus answered him with this. Never shall a day prove me unfit for such valor, only let fortune fall in my favor. But more than all you offer, there is one thing I ask. My mother of Priam's ancient line, unhappy woman, left Ilium's land and Acestes' city rather than leave me. I now leave her ignorant of whatever peril this may be, and without telling her goodbye, because I swear by night in your own right hand, I could not bear a mother's tears. So I beg you, comfort her in her need and desolation. Let me hope this of you, and I will go more boldly into danger. The Dardanians were moved to tears, Aeolus most of all. This picture of a son's devotion touched his heart, and he said, Rest assured that all will be worthy of your great endeavor. Your mother will be mine, lacking only the name, Creusa. No small gratitude awaits the woman who bore such a son. Whatever the outcome of your action, I swear by this head, by which my father once swore, that what I promise to you on your return will be for your mother and family as well. And with tears in his eyes, he unbuckles his sword, the gold-crusted wonder forged by Lycaon and fitted by him with an ivory sheath. Mnestheus gives Nisus a shaggy lion skin, and loyal Aletes swaps helmets with him. They head out at once, and the whole company, young and old, escort them to the gate with prayers. Aeolus, young and beautiful, but mature beyond his years, carefully gives them messages for his father. But the winds would scatter them all to the clouds above. They leave, cross the trenches, and make their way through night's shadows to the enemy camp, where soon they will be the death of many. Everywhere they look, they see drunken men asleep in the grass, chariots tilted upright, soldiers sprawled among the wheels and reins, weapons and wine jars lying about. The son of Hertakis was first to speak. This is it, Euryalus. Cover our rear and keep your eyes open. I'll lead, and I'll make a road of blood you can't miss. Then he closed his mouth and addressed Romneys with his sword. This proud man propped on a pile of blankets and snoring loudly, was a king himself, and served King Turnus well as his augur, but could not augur his way out of death. Nisus killed his three attendants first, and Remus's armor-bearer, and the charioteer, finding him at the horse's feet, and then severed the horse's drooping necks. Then he decapitated Ramnes himself, and left the trunk spurting blood. The couch and the ground were soaked with warm black gore. Nisus killed also Lamyrus, Lamus, and young Saranus, a handsome boy who had played late that night, but was mastered by sleep, happy, if only he had played his game until dawn. A lion that has not fed rages through a sheep pen, mad with hunger, as it mangles the flock. The weak animals stand numb with fear, and the lion roars from its blood-stained mouth. So too Euryalus, burning with rage, fell upon the faceless multitude, Fadus, Herbesus, and Abaris never knew what hit them. Rotus, though, was awake and saw it all, cowering behind a large mixing bowl. As he rose, Euryalus buried his sword in his chest up to the hilt and then drew the blade out. Drenched in death, Rotus belched forth his purpled life, bringing up wine mixed with blood as Euryalus pressed on, seething in the dark. He was approaching Mesopus's troops, and by the fire's dying light was watching the tethered horse graze when Nisus, who felt his friend was being carried away by bloodlust, said, Let's get out of here. It's almost light. We've had our revenge, and we've cut away through the enemy lines. They left behind whole sets of solid silver armor, bowls too, and beautiful carpets. Euryalus did take Romnes's gear with his gold-studded sword belt, gifts that long ago wealthy Caedicus sent to Remulus of Tiber as a pledge of friendship. As Remulus lay dying, he passed them on to his grandson, and then the Rutulians took them as spoils of war. This gear Euryalus tore away and put on, all for nothing. As he put on his head Messapus's plumed helmet, then the pair left the camp and ran for cover.
They left behind whole sets of solid silver armor, bowls too, and beautiful carpets. Euryalus did take Romney's gear with his gold-studded sword belt, gifts that long ago wealthy Caedicus sent to Remulus of Tiber as a pledge of friendship. As Remulus lay dying, he passed them on to his grandson, and then the Rutulians took them as spoils of war. This gear Euryalus tore away and put on, all for nothing. And he put on his head Masapus's plumed helmet, then the pair left the camp and ran for cover. Meanwhile, a company of horsemen sent ahead from the Latin city, while the rest of the troops halted on the plain, rode up with a reply for Turnus, 300 strong, all under shield, with Vulcans in command. The walls of the camp were just ahead, when off in the distance they saw the pair turning off on a path to the left. And in the dim shadows, the helmet Euryalus thoughtlessly wore betrayed him. Volsons caught its gleaming reflection and shouted from the head of the column, Halt! Who are you? Why are you armed? And what mission are you on? Meanwhile, a company of horsemen sent ahead from the Latin city, while the rest of the troops halted on the plain, rode up with a reply for Turnus. Three hundred strong, all under shield, with Volsons in command. The walls of the camp were just ahead, when off in the distance they saw the pair turning off on a path to the left, and in the dim shadows the helmet Euryalus thoughtlessly wore betrayed him. Volsons caught its gleaming reflection and shouted from the head of the column, Halt! Who are you? Why are you armed, and what mission are you on? They made no response, but hurried into the woods and trusted to night. The horsemen rode to block the crossways and seal the perimeter of the woods with guards. It was a wide and dense forest, with thickets of dark ilex and brambles everywhere, and trails that glimmered through open patches. The dark branches and his ponderous spoils hampered Euryalus, and the network of trails confused and panicked him. Nisus got through in a blind rush and would have escaped the enemy and those regions later called Alban, at that time part of Latinus's pasture, when he stopped and looked back to no avail for his missing friend. Poor Euryalus, why did I leave you? How can I find you? And Nisus retraced his tangled path through the treacherous forest wandering through the silent thickets until he heard the horses and the telltale sounds of men in pursuit. A few moments later, a cry reached his ears, and he saw Euryalus, misled by the terrain, betrayed by the night, and overpowered in the sudden tumult. Euryalus struggled desperately as the band dragged him away. Nisus was at a loss. How could he possibly rescue his friend? With what weapons? What force? Or should he charge right into their swords to a swift and beautiful death? Pumping his spear arm, he looked up to the moon and prayed, Be with me now, goddess, and help me in my need, O daughter of Latona, glory of the stars and guardian of groves. If ever my father brought you offerings on my behalf, if ever I myself hunted in your honor, hung sacrifices in your dome, or fastened them to your temple's roof, guide my weapons through the air, and let me break up that party over there. Nysus spoke and put all of his weight into the throw. The spear split the dark air, hit a warrior named Solmo in the back, and snapped. The splintered shaft punched through to his chest, and Solmo spun around, hemorrhaging warm blood and heaving gasps until he collapsed into cold death. The Rutulians looked around in every direction, breathing more sharply. Nysus balanced another spear over his shoulder, and while they hesitated, it went hissing through both of Tachus's temples and warmed itself deep in his cloven brain. Volsen seethed with rage, but could not see who threw the spear and where to unleash his fury. All right, then, you will pay me with hot blood for both their deaths. As he spoke, he went for Euryalus with drawn sword. This was too much for Nisus. Out of his mind with terror and no longer able to remain hidden in the darkness or endure such pain, he shouted, Me! I did it! Turn your swords on me, Rutulians! It was all my idea. He couldn't have done it, wouldn't have dared. I swear by the sky and the stars that see all, he only loved his unlucky friend too much. Thus Nisus, but the sword driven home with force, sliced through the ribs, and gashed the white breast. Euryalus rolled over, dead. Dark blood ran over his beautiful limbs, and his head sank down 
onto one shoulder. As a purple flower cut by a plow droops in death, or as a poppy bows its weary head heavy with spring rain. Nisus rushed among them, going only for Volsens. Volsens alone was his care. The troops surrounded him, tried to push him back, but he kept on coming, his sword flashing like lightning until he buried the blade full in the face of the shrieking Rutulian, and dying himself, deprived his enemy of life. Happy pair, if my poetry has any power, never shall you be blotted from memory, as long as the house of Aeneas still stands on the capital's unmoving rock and the Roman father rules supreme. The Rutulians went back to their camp victorious and weeping, carrying their spoils and the lifeless body of Volsons. Their lamentation was still louder in the camp when they found Romney's pale corpse and so many of their best men, Saranus, Numa, massacred. A great throng rushed to the dead and dying men. The ground steamed with slaughter, and the foaming blood ran in rivulets. Talking among themselves, they recognized the spoils, Messapus's shining helmet, other bits of gear won back with so much sweat. Dawn left to Thonis in his saffron bed and showered new light over all the lands. When the sun streamed in and unveiled the world, Turnus, in full-dress armor himself, called his men to arms. The commanders marshaled the bronze lines into battle formation and honed their anger with the latest reports. They fixed the heads of Nisus and Euryalus on upright spears, a soul-wrenching sight, and fell in behind them with a roar. The Trojans formed up on the left bank of their walls. The river protected the right side, manning the wide trenches. The troops, posted in the towers, stood in stark grief at the sight of the transfixed heads they knew so well heads now dripping with dark gore. Meanwhile, rumor winged her way with the news through the fearful town, swift to the ears of Euryalus's mother. Her bones turned to ice. The shuttle fell from her hands and the thread unreeled. She flew out of the house, tearing out her hair, her voice quavering in high lamentation, and in her madness made for the ramparts and front lines of battle, ignoring the men, the danger, the weapons flying, and then she filled the sky with her plaintive cries. Is this you I see, Euryalus, you, my last and only comfort in old age? How could you leave me alone like this? And when you were sent into danger, not even to tell your poor mother goodbye? Now you will lie in a strange land, pray to the dogs and birds of Latium, and I, your mother, did not bury you, or close your eyes, or bathe your wounds. I did not shroud you with the robe I made for you, working at the loom night and day to console an old woman's sorrow. Where am I to go? What land now holds your dismembered body? Is this all, my son, you bring back to me of yourself? Is this what I have pursued by land and sea? Rutulians, if you have any decency, run me through. Throw all your spears at me. Or you, our Father in heaven, be merciful and blast this hateful life into Tartarus, since I cannot myself break life's cruel bonds. Her speech stunned their souls. Too shaken to fight, the entire army gave way to grief, until Ilionius and the weeping Aeolus had Idaeus and Actor gather up the poor woman and carry her indoors. Trumpets sounded, their terrible bronze call, and the shouting that followed echoed in the sky. The Volscians locked shields and charged, determined to fill the trenches and pull down the palisade. One contingent attacked the Trojan lines, where they were thinnest, and threw up ladders to scale the wall. The Trojans experienced... At defending walls, threw down on them everything they could, thrusting with long poles and rolling down stones of deadly weight in an attempt to break their shield formation. The Volscians were doing well under its protection, but when the Teucrians rolled up a huge boulder and rolled it down where the enemy was thickest, the Volscians broke ranks and scattered, no longer willing to fight blind. Standing back, they now attacked the wall with javelins and arrows. Elsewhere, Mezentius, a grim sight, was hurling his Tuscan pine torches, and Messapus, son of Neptune, breaker of horses, was ripping down the rampart and calling for ladders. Breathe into me, muses, I pray, O Calliope, as I sing the slaughter and death Turnus dealt, and whom each hero sent down to Orcus. Unroll with me the great scroll of war. Looming above the plain, there was a tower connected to the wall by high gangways. The Italians concentrated their attack here and were doing their mightiest to topple it. 
inside the Trojans' defense was to hurl stones and projectiles through open slits. Leading the way, Turnus threw a blazing torch that stuck in the tower's side. The fire, fanned by the wind, burned posts and planks, eating them away. The men trapped inside panicked and edged back en masse to the tower's far side. Under the sudden shift in weight, the entire structure collapsed and the whole sky thundered with the crash. The men fell to the ground, dead and dying, crushed by the mass, impaled by their own weapons and the splintered wood. Only two made it out by the skin of their teeth, Helenor and Lycus. Helenor, in the prime of youth, was the son of this minion slave who had borne him secretly to the Maonian king. His mother sent him to Troy, arming him as best she could with a naked sword and a blank shield, as yet ungloried. When he found himself surrounded by Turnus's thousands and hemmed in by the Latin lines, he charged. A wild beast, hedged in by a circle of hunters, rages against them and, knowing it will die, bounds into the air and onto their spears. So too Helenor ran to meet his death where he saw the enemy was thickest. Lycus, though, a far swifter runner, sprinted through a rain of weapons and reached the wall. He was trying to pull himself over the top, reaching for his friend's hands, when Turnus, who had been following him with his spear, laughed at him, saying, You thought you could get away, didn't you? And as he spoke, he pulled Lycus down with a large chunk of the wall. Think of a hare or a snow-white swan in the talons of an eagle or a wolf snatching from the fold a bleating lamb. A shout went up, and the Rutulians pressed on, filling the trenches with earth and throwing burning torches on the roofs. Ilionius hit Lucetius with a huge craggy rock as he was coming up to the gate with fire and laid him low. Liger killed Amathion, good with a spear. Asilus killed Coroneus, a skilled archer. Canius cut down Ortigius and himself fell to Turnus, who went on to kill Itis, Clonius, Deoxippus, Promolus, Sagaris, and Idas, the latter as he stood on the topmost tower. Capus then killed Pervernus, who had just been nicked by Thamilla's spear. Pervernus panicked, threw down his shield, and moved his hand to the wound, and Capus's arrow flew home, punching deep into his left side, a fatal wound that tore through his lungs. Arson's son stood in splendid armor, his embroidered mantle dyed Iberian violet. Noble and handsome, he had been reared in a grove of Mars near the Simatheus River and Pelicus's altar. Seeing him, Mezentius dropped both his spears, whirled his sling above his head three times, and split the man's head open with slugs of lead, laying him out full length in the sand. Then Ascanius, for the first time in war, took aim with an arrow. Until this moment, he had only shot at animals in the hunt, but now he shot and killed Numanus Remulus, who had recently married Turnus's sister, Numanus. Numanus was striding out from the rank, saying things both proper and improper. His newly found royalty had gone to his head, and he boasted loudly of his heroic stature. Shame on you, Phrygians. Twice now your city has been taken. Aren't you getting tired of being besieged and warding off death with walls? Look at the great heroes fighting us for our wives. What god, what insanity has driven you to Italy? There are no sons of Atreus here, no lying Ulysses, no, just us, a tough breed. We bring our newborn sons to the river to toughen them up in ice-cold water. When they are boys, they hunt day and night. They break horses for fun and shoot arrows, but they know how to work and to do without, whether it's busting sod or shaking cities in war. Our whole life is worn away with iron. We goad our oxen with spear butts, and old age doesn't slow us down either or make us weak. We press helmets into white hair, and we love to bring home new spoils and live on plunder. But you, you wear embroidered saffron and purple satin. You like to loaf and dance. Your tunics have sleeves and your head's bonnets. You are really Phrygian women. Go over to Dindymus, where they play those double pipes you are used to hearing. The tambourines are calling you, and the Beresynthian boxwood flutes of the mother on Ida. Get out of here, and leave war to men. Ascanius did not take these boasts and taunts. Facing Numanus, he fit the arrow's notch to the horsehair string, drew it back, and paused to invoke Jupiter with vows. Almighty Jupiter, ascent to my bold start, and I will bring gifts yearly to your temple. Set before your altar an ox with gilded brow, white as the moon, head as high as its mother's, already butting horns and scuffing the sand. 
The father heard and thundered on the left in the clear sky, and in the same moment the lethal bow twanged and the arrow whined as it bored through the air and Remulus's skull, iron cleaving both of his temples. So, you want to mock our valor with haughty words? This is the answer the twice-captured Phrygians give the Rutulians. Ascanius said no more. The Teucrians cheered and their spirits soared. And in the high regions of the sky, Apollo, his rich hair streaming, was looking down from his seat on a cloud at the Ausonian lines and the Trojan town. He addressed the triumphant Aeolus in words such as these. Well done, young hero, born of a god, and with gods to come in your line. All fated war will justly subside under the people of Asaracus. You are bigger than Troy. Apollo spoke and shot down from high heaven, parting the gusty air. He found Ascanius and then transformed himself into aged Butes, who had been Anchises' armor-bearer, and trusted companion. Aeneas later assigned him to Ascanius. Apollo strode on exactly like the old man, the same complexion, voice, white hair, even the harsh clank his armor made, and he spoke these words to fiery Aeolus. Let it be enough, child of Aeneas, that Numanus has fallen to your arrow unavenged. Apollo grants you this honor, your first, and is not jealous of your archery, which rivals his own. But now, my son, stay out of the war. While he was speaking, Apollo left the sight of men and vanished into thin air. The Dardanian princes knew it was the god. As he flew off, they heard the quiver rattle on his back. And so, in accordance with the will of Phoebus, they reined in Ascanius, eager as he was for war and went themselves back to the fighting and put their lives on the line. A shout ran all along the wall's perimeter. From tower to tower, they bent their bows and rifled javelins with leather thongs. Spears littered the ground. Shields and helmets clashed and rang. The battle surged, like lashing rain that comes out of the west when the watery goat stars rise in the sky. Or hail that showers into the sea when Jupiter, bristling with southerly gales, stirs up a storm and explodes the clouds. Pandarus and Bitius, tall as pine trees on their native Ida, were sons of Alcanor and the wood nymph Iara, who bore them in a grove of Jupiter. Now they opened the gate their captain had put them in charge of, and, confident in their strength of arms, waved the enemy in. They themselves stood on either side of the gate, sheathed in iron, plumes rippling on their towering heads, as twin oaks on the banks of the river Po, or the pleasant Athesis, lift their unshorn heads into heaven's air and nod their leafy crowns. When they saw the entrance was clear, the Rutulians rushed in. They did not last long. Quersons and Equocolus, a handsome warrior, and the daredevil Tamaris, and Haemon, whose father was Mars, were all routed along with their troops. They turned tail and ran, or lost their lives in the very gateway. The Trojans, their spirits rising, massed at the gate. Engaging the enemy hand to hand, they ventured farther out. Turnus was creating havoc of his own in another sector. When word reached him that the enemy had tasted blood and were leaving the gates wide open, he quit what he was doing, and his rage flaring ran to the Trojan gate and the twin giants. First out to meet him was Antiphates, Sarpedon's bastard son by a Mycenaean woman. Turnus killed him with a spear cast, the hard Italian colonel gliding through the soft air to enter Antiphates' gullet and tunneled deep into his chest. The dark gaping wound surged with foaming blood, and the steel grew warm in the transfixed lung. Merope's next, then Eremus, and Aphidnus fell to Turnus. And then Bitius, eyes burning, rage in his heart. It was not Turnus's spear that undid Bitius. He would never have lost his life to a spear, but a whirling battle pike of lead and iron that split the air like a bolt of lightning. Two layers of oxide and a corslet of double-plated gold could not withstand it. Bidius's gigantic frame collapsed. Earth groaned when he fell, and his shield crashed like thunder. A huge mass of rock falls on Bai's shore as men construct sea walls, and as it falls, it trails ruin behind it, crashing down into the water to rest in its depths. The sea churns with black sand, and the sound rumbles through high prokaita, and in Narami's lava bed, laid on Jove's orders above Typhoeus. And now Mars, the war god, multiplied the Latins' courage and twisted his sharp goads deep in their hearts. 
But among the Trojans, he unleashed black terror and panic. The Latins, with the war gods in their souls, saw their chance and converged. When Pandarus saw his brother crumple and how the day's fortunes were going, he put his shoulder to the gate and swung it closed, leaving many of his comrades shut outside in the bitter fighting, but enclosing many with himself and welcoming them as they rushed in. But in his madness, he did not notice the Rutulian prince bursting in among the streaming ranks and unwittingly shut him up in the town like a great tiger let into a sheep's pen. A new light gleamed in Turnus's eyes, and his armor rang steadily. The bloody crests on his helmet quivered, and his shield flashed with lightning. In one awful moment, the Trojans recognized that hateful face, that massive form, and were thrown into a panic. Then gigantic Pandora sprang forward, seething with rage for his brother's death, and spoke out, This is not Amata's bridal palace or downtown Ardea. You are looking at the enemy's camp, and there is no way for you to escape. And Turnus, smiling calmly at the man, bring it on. If you have the guts, you can tell Priam there is another Achilles here. Thus Turnus, Pandarus threw his spear, knotty and rough, with all his might, but the wind took it. Saturnian Juno deflected the shot, and it struck in the gate, and Turnus, right, but don't think I'll miss. Nobody dodges my weapons. With that he leapt high, and put his weight into his sword, cleaving Pandarus's brow in two between the temples, and splitting open his boyish face. He fell with a clash, and the earth trembled under the impact of his enormous body, stretched on the ground in brain-spattered armor. Pandarus lay dying, his neatly parted head dangling equally to each of his shoulders. The Trojans, terrified, beat a hasty retreat, and if it had occurred to the victorious hero to burst the gate's bars and let in his troops, that day would have been the last for the war and the Trojan people. But passion for slaughter made him rage on. First he took out Phalaris, and then Gyges, hamstringing the latter, seizing their spears, he threw them at the backs of the escaping enemy. Juno multiplied his strength, and he dispatched Halus and Phegeus, piercing his shield, and then Alcander, Aeleus, Nomon, and Pertanus, who were up on the wall, urging men on. They never knew what hit them. When Lynceus, rallying his troops, made a move, Turnus came at him from the wall on the right, and with one swipe of his flashing sword severed the man's head, which came to rest some distance away, still in its helmet. Amicus was next, a formidable hunter who excelled in the art of poisoning arrows, and then Clytius, son of Aeolus, and Cretheus, dear to the muses, the muses' companion Cretheus, who was forever tuning his lyre, setting verses to music and singing of horses, the arms of men, and war. When word of the carnage reached them, the two Crean captains, Menestheus and Serestus, came forward to see their men scattered and their enemy within the gates, and Menestheus sharply, where are you going? Do you have some other walls to protect you? Countrymen, shall one man trapped inside slaughter a whole town unpunished? Send so many of our best young men to Orcus. Cowards, have you no shame? No pity for your country, for your ancient gods, for great Aeneas? This speech steeled their spirits. They halted in dense formation, and Turnus gave ground step by step, making for the part of the town bounded by the river. The Teucrians pressed him all the harder, shouting loudly and closing in. Hunters crowd around a savage lion, their spears ready. The lion is wary, but glares angrily as it gives ground, and although its valor will not allow it to turn its back, it cannot, for all his desire, break through the hunters and their spears. So too Turnus. Hesitantly, retracing his steps, his heart seething with rage. Even then he attacked twice, routing them along the wall each time. But when the entire army gathered together, Juno did not dare give Turnus the strength to oppose them all. For Jupiter sent Iris down from heaven with stern warnings for his sister that Turnus must leave the Teucrian camp. And so the hero could not hold his own with sword or shield, not with all the missiles raining down on him. His helmet rang incessantly, stones cracking the solid bronze open. The horsehair plumes were torn from his crest, and his shield could no longer withstand the blows. The Trojans and Menestheus himself struck like lightning, hurling spear after spear. Sweat poured down Turnus's entire body in black streams. His breath came in gasps, and his arms and legs shook convulsively. At last, in full armor, he dove headfirst into the river. Tiber welcomed him, and buoying him up in his yellow water, 
He washed away the blood and floated Turnus back to his comrades on a gentle current. <laughs>